So in the past couple years, I've noticed that homesteading, slow living, living off the grid, cottage core, borderline trad wife lifestyle has been romanticized heavily on the internet. I think this is simply just a reaction to capitalism and people are tired of the consumerism and excessive lifestyles that have been promoted on social media for so long. Being a white collar girl boss who can do it all is no longer the ideal lifestyle for women and mothers, but now the in vogue lifestyle for women is to be a mother of six barefoot in the kitchen pregnant with one baby on her arm as she cooks lemon squares and looks out into her home garden like it's very classic and traditional and I myself have had this fantasy before as someone who is living in New York and you know wants to find love and start a family and escape into the wilderness with my husband and my babies and we live off the grid and grow carrots in the backyard I don't know like you know what I'm saying it sounds very cute and romantic and I totally get the appeal of it. However, I understand that there is more than meets the eye when it comes to this kind of lifestyle because not only is it very challenging to be a mother, but it's also very challenging to raise a farm and to grow your own food and to care for livestock. It's a very challenging, rigorous, and laborious lifestyle that not a lot of people, I think, are understanding because I feel like there's going to be a movement of like liberals and conservatives who will just kind of ideal idealize this lifestyle and run away and try to you know, you know buy acres of land and they are going to realize like oh this is really hard work and this is not like I saw on TikTok. So I'm not looking to get pregnant, but I still enjoy the feelings that are associated with having a baby. So today's sponsor is Lalo. So here with me, I've got the Lalo Sila Cruz personal massager. This thing comes with some great features, one of them being the cruise control feature. When you increase pressure on the toy, it increases its vibrations to increase intensity and it is fully automatic. It also has Sensonic technology, which allows you to feel all those good vibrations without direct contact. The silicon used in this device absorbs all the vibrations and sends them right to your pleasure center for deeper pleasure and gentler sensations. It's also built with a wide mouth so it covers your entire pleasure center to maximize pleasure when using it. It's very easy to use, very intuitive, and is meant for anybody of all levels of experience whether you're a beginner or you have experience with toys in the past. So if you're interested in getting your hands on one of these then use my link in my description. Now back to the video. Thank you very much. The irony in all of this is like people want to go off the grid and live this lifestyle that seems to be like technology free and like back to basics and very grounded and earthy. But you're getting this idea, you're, you're getting this inspiration from the internet. And we all know that the internet and social media is meant to romanticize and glamorize whatever is being presented to you. That's the essence of social media, right? So people are envious of this lifestyle and they either want to emulate it themselves or they want to escape their life and watch this online content. So first, I want to, you know, begin to peel back the layers of this conversation with first the romanticized and the performance of motherhood itself on the internet. Mommy blogging has been around for a while and it seems to get more and more popular as the years go on. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with romanticizing motherhood, like, to a certain extent. I think a lot of women really struggle with being new moms and it's important to romanticize the bits that aren't as romantic because I think for some women that's what gets them through the day, you know? And so it's important to see the beauty and the romance in being a mom because they're, it's there. Like that, It's a very beautiful and magical thing, but it's also really hard and gross and sticky and challenging and not. it's not always fun. So I think to a certain extent, romanticizing motherhood and your experience as a mother is fine. Um, I think as women, we are put under so much pressure to present this image of perfection, especially as a mother, because, you know, to be effortless and beautiful and graceful and whimsical as a mom is to be a good mom and to be struggling and to show any form of dissatisfaction or even bitterness makes you a bad mother. And I remember that scene in, um, I think it was Sex in the City, one of the Sex in the City movies where Miranda and Charlotte are talking about being moms and Charlotte, you know, it takes her a while to admit it, but she's like, I honestly don't love being a mom all the time. Being a mother is not enough. I miss my job. 
You're not gonna leave me hanging out here alone feeling like the worst mother in the world, are you? I have enjoyed not having them around. I needed a break. Yes, you did. Sometimes I go in the other room and I close the door and I just let her scream. Isn't that awful? No, that's survival. I feel guilty. I, I feel so guilty because all I ever prayed for was to have a family and now I have these two beautiful girls. And? They're driving me crazy. Take a sip. Women are expected to just love and embrace motherhood and to find joy in every single little moment but that's just not realistic that's not the reality of motherhood um even my mom i was talking to her about this video idea and she was like yeah i remember after i had you and your brother and i begged your father to send me to las vegas because i was tired of being a mom and that's a very real thing and it's like oh to say that makes you a bad mother but it, it's you, you're just a human being <laughs> and so i think with this romanticization of motherhood and the performance of it all it kind of re reinforces this idea that, you know, being a mom should be this um, nothing but joyful experience, but it's it's not. And I can imagine that other moms seeing stuff like this would compare themselves and think, oh my god, like, I can't do this for my kid, or I'm not this kind of mom. I don't have these resources, so am I a bad mother? Like, am I inadequate because I'm not dancing with my kids in the living room every day for two hours and skipping through the park and giving them the best, healthy, organic snacks that I grew from my backyard and I think with this girls young women especially may look at these TikToks and these Instagram accounts and think oh motherhood looks so fun I want to be a mom and I think the same thing I get baby fever constantly on TikTok and I think you know what I want one of those I want one of those can I have one and it's you know a baby isn't an, a cute new accessory that you can get rid of at Goodwill once it's out of trend like you're your mother for life so and you know I don't necessarily blame moms for creating this curated image of motherhood on social media because that's what social media is for, right? Like, no one wants to document or watch a mother who hasn't slept in days and hasn't showered or combed her hair get pissed and shat on by her newborn baby. Like, nobody's interested in that. So, of course, you're only going to see the beautiful parts of it. But, you know, I think sometimes there are mommy bloggers or family bloggers who take it too far and they are genuinely exploiting their children for views and for money and it just has become this way to capitalize off of children, which is really weird and messed up. I think maybe the cottage core homesteading lifestyle seems a bit more accessible or approachable than like the girl boss mom who does everything and she still has a high powered high paying job but she also takes care of her kids um no nannies you know things like that but it seems like in both scenarios women are expected to do it all and it's like where's the husband where's the father we are still perpetuating this idea that women need to be creating the home and and beautifying the home and taking care of the children and cooking and cleaning and that makes you a good woman that makes you a good wife that makes you a good mother and still even within this modern homesteading families there's still only an emphasis on the mother and there's no emphasis on the father and like what he's doing <laughs> i'm gonna talk about ballerina farm a lot in this video and i'm going to reference this article called the edenic allure of ballerina farm and to switch gears, I'm going to share this interesting quote that I think summarizes what I was saying about social media and the performance of motherhood. We know that Instagram hides far more than it tells, and so many of these accounts are stories with carefully molded plots in the same fashion of any Hollywood film. But I find this particular mix of myth-making particularly pernicious. I think it's the fumbling part of it, like, oh, I'm bad at beauty cleaning because I'm a farmer, even though she's been doing this for her entire life, and I'm a bad farmer because I'm a beauty queen, but we're happy and that's what matters. Your work occupies a particular ideological crossroads, the performance of motherhood, the maintenance of white supremacy, oftentimes alongside that performance, and the imperatives of public performance of womanhood and family as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is a long sentence, but Ballerina Farm is a complicated text. 
I've described some of what I see when I look at this account. Some of it is very surface level. So for further context, Ballerina Farm is an account on TikTok that follows the life of Hannah Nealman, a mother of seven, who is a former Juilliard ballet student who is now a rancher on her farm in Utah called the Ballerina Farm. She's also a Mormon and she's also a pageant queen. Her life appears to be absolutely gorgeous and idyllic and beautiful and womanly <laughs> and you know on the surface there's absolutely nothing wrong with her content I think it's beautiful it's fun to watch and it makes me want to you know fantasize about having a life like hers on the surface it seems as though she's making an honest living from selling the meat from her farm but in reality she's actually married to Daniel Nealman who is the son of David Nealman the CEO of JetBlue so she's got a lot of resources Sources. She's got access to millions of dollars. And so that is the reality of her life, of her lifestyle, how she manages to fund this lifestyle. It's not just from the farm itself, but from her husband's millionaire fortune. So much of the way motherhood is represented on social media is a performance, but the people performing and the people viewing pretend it's not a performance. Here was something completely different. She was openly performing, for us, for her children, for herself, and that was beautiful. At first glance, this performance is happening in what appears to be pretty standard circumstances. The viewer has no idea she's connected to hundreds of millions of dollars. She's wearing a kind of mom uniform. She's not in a Pinterest-ready environment. It felt like she was trying to convey what I often try to convey. Personal rigor and transcendence can exist in the midst of motherhood. And you know, like, as a rich person, she could be spending her money on something a lot more frivolous and obnoxious noxious so you know I, I, it's like a, a lesser evil I suppose to spend your money on a farm and like raising your children on a ranch in Utah I think the average suburban or urban living person thinks that to live on a farm and and to to live this humble lifestyle is cheaper and more affordable when in reality it takes a lot of money to run a farm and just to get things started but to also maintain it um, it's a huge financial risk and keep in mind you know this woman lives in a large home on 328 acres of land um, in a house that supports nine people and has exposed shiplap walls with insulation outside of the house, which I still cannot get over, and this infamous $20,000 stove. So this article does a really great job at breaking down the average cost of supporting this lifestyle and the income from the farm. Buying a 328 acre ranch for millions of dollars to start a direct consumer beef business is not normal for many reasons. The first of which is that the kind of direct-to-consumer beef business you can run on 328 acres is not going to cover the many costs of living on the land. But on average, you can have 100 to 150 cattle on a ranch that size. If you were selling 100 cows a year, after you deduct the cost of feed, pasture, maintenance, breeding, vet costs, machine hire, processing, and everything else, you might take away anywhere between $35,000 and $60,000 a year, with $60,000 being the very bonkers high end. So based off of the amount of land that she has, she's not making a huge profit, not enough to support her family alone. Ballerina Farms' form of nuclear family PR induces like moonshine levels of intoxication. Just a handful of myths on display here. You really can go back to the land. You can have six children, seventh on the way, and still perfectly comply with body and beauty ideals. You don't need makeup to be beautiful or a gym to discipline your body because you can just braid your hair and dance with your children and or husband. You can make money off of farming. The list goes on. There's this expectation for motherhood and to be again beautiful whimsical whatever and to have this easy slow living lifestyle and you can have it all and it's all possible but you know that's not available for the average person if you're a millionaire then sure that's totally possible if you're born into beauty and wealth then this lifestyle is more realistic but this lifestyle isn't realistic for most people farm life is hard man uh it's not beautiful it's not picture perfect it's ugly and gross and smelly and dusty and you're like constantly picking up shit waking up at four in the morning doing intense manual labor every day and you're probably not going to get to frolic around in a field wearing a flouncy floral dress and clogs like that's just not the reality of it first of all growing food is hard investment in materials and feed quickly adds up and the man hours required to stay on top of it all is absolutely phenomenal. This is so yucky. 
And it needs to be changed like every day, twice a day if it's too cold. Nothing, and I mean nothing, brings death to the forefront of your mind than having to put a baby chick with a crooked beak and failing to thrive out of its misery. And when it comes to harvest time, well, it takes a deep understanding of the cycle of life and death and a strong sense of gratitude to make the decision to take another animal's life to feed your own. If anything, that daily reminder of life and death has really been a catalyst for us to be making such a big change. I mean, suppose we were to leave this world tomorrow or next week. Is this how we would spend our remaining days? Don't get me wrong, homesteading has been a blast, seriously. But 50 plus more years of the same thing in this same place? That's just not it for me right now. Leaving our property for more than a day has proven extremely challenging. We love to be spontaneous, going on weekend trips and overnight camping adventures on a whim. But organizing house sitters and ensuring everything is safe and secure while we're away, it's a burden that ultimately results in us just never leaving. Starting a farm and buying land and livestock requires a lot of money, and there's a good chance you will lose all of that money. And without proper experience and finances, the average person could not handle this and wouldn't want to. More and more people are doing some version of pretending, and they don't need a dad worth millions to do it. They see something like the ballerina farm and think, oh, they're right. This is better than what I've got here. It's simpler, it's pure, and then they take their tech money and the remote job and set up homestead in Montana, Wyoming, or Utah. They buy land from real agriculture producers who cannot hold on any longer, but the sort of purchase, along with their lack of need for the land to actually make their living, inflates the price of land all around them. So more producers sell, but at the same time, fewer producers who actually live off the land can buy or rent it for things like grazing because the cost of land keeps going up. So spot on and explains perfectly why this romanticization of like, farm life and homesteading can be really dangerous and have negative impacts on real people. Lastly, I want to talk about the like cottage core pick-me-ism of it all and the crossover of homesteading and religion because this whole lifestyle really promotes gender roles in its most traditional sense. And I don't think all like traditional gender roles are bad. Like I too would like to be a mother and stay home with my children for a few years and take on that role as their nurturer and caregiver. Um, I don't want to do it all by myself. I would like to have, uh, you know, a, a husband to help me with all that stuff. But um, I think this kind of lifestyle has opened up the floodgates for this kind of like divine feminine, like tapping into your divine feminine. This is how you achieve peak feminine energy, you know, like to be um, closer to the earth is to be closer to God and, and to be fulfilling your purpose as a woman in the eyes of God. Um, there is a comment on one of Ballerina Farm's Instagram posts that I think explains it perfectly. And it says, Ugh, this is so beautiful. It is a man's purpose to make a home. It is a woman's to make the home beautiful. And that really just like says it all. And, you know, the fact that Ballerina Farm is a Mormon makes a lot of sense because she's like pretty much doing exactly what she was bred to do. Now, obviously everyone who is interested in homesteading or living off of a farm isn't like a Mormon or a religious person who believes that women shouldn't have rights or autonomy. But I think it's important to note because I think a lot of liberals for example will like see this lifestyle and think it's so idyllic and perfect but there is like a bit of a, a seedy underbelly to it all that has roots in misogyny and um, even you know racism and colonialism like a lot of this land that folks are buying was stolen from indigenous people. I mean, we are we are sitting on stolen land right now, at least like as an American, I can confidently say that. And so there's, there's a, a history to all of this that needs to be acknowledged, I believe, and a culture that is prominent and not in favor of women. Mormon women have no official authority in the LDS church. Only men can be ordained into the priesthood, and yet LDS women are still expected to live up to Eve's heritage. They are tasked with helping humanity progress towards heaven. Instead of walking out of a garden, they are supposed to walk into their homes and use their influence to direct their family to heaven. LDS women are also encouraged to be public from our homes, to preach and teach and well, generally influence. And I think that's so interesting because, I mean, 
that explains why Ballerina Farm does what she does. You know, the, the role of the woman isn't to persuade, as they say in this article, but to influence. They're not meant to use dialogue or to have autonomy or power like a man does, but to simply influence in this like low key, subdued way. And so ballerina farm is literally an influencer and this is like her way of you know bringing her family closer to heaven with this understanding of how lds girls need to begin to rely on their ability to influence it's no wonder that many lds women have taken to mom fluencing and home fluencing and now farm fluencing like fish who finally found water don't be tricked by the mom fluencers because they might just be using this as a religious agenda i don't know and i don't mean this as a way to pass judgment on those who are religious like you are the only one who understands a relationship with god i do have reservations about more about mormonism as a woman i must admit but um you know all of this like mom fluencing and everything like that a lot of the times is connected to uh a greater spiritual purpose that may not necessarily align with your ideals. Again, that's not to say you shouldn't live on a farm. Um, I would say my biggest like point here is like, don't just leave your city apartment to a rural farm and in Montana because you think it would be like a cute aesthetic to like live like a cottage core mommy fantasy because that's just, you know, that's not reality and it, and it really affects people in real life who have been doing this for years. So um, before you get into your rural Kim K bag, just, you know, here are some things to consider. If you live on a farm, grew up on a farm, grew up Mormon, any of that stuff, I would love to hear your thoughts. Or if you're a mother, especially a young mom, um, but all moms of all ages, please sound off in the comments because I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm not a mom, of course. I don't know what it's like to be a mother and how challenging it is. I can only just imagine. But um, yeah, that's what the comment section is for. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say and um, can continue the discussion down below. So yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.